Paul Hopewell. Welcome back to my workshop. I make all sorts of parts and components in my workshop and I show you how I did it. In this video I tried to find out what was the issue with my Taylor three jaw chuck. And I want to know why the setting bar waggled around like it did in the last video. One of the first things I checked was the runout using all the jaw sets that I had for this chuck and in turn checked the runout using a bit of ground bar. I found that all the jaw sets had the same level of eccentricity. That's around 0.28 millimetres, approximately 11 thou. For them all to have the same level of run out, the issue has to lie in the back plate or something in contact with it. This is a rough sketch of the headstock, spindle nose, back plate and chuck. I can't imagine the chuck body having any issues at this moment, but I wouldn't be surprised if the back plate had a bruise or something on one of its faces. If one of these faces had a small bruise on it, then it could very easily throw the chuck off centre causing the very issue I have. After removing the chuck from the spindle nose, a close visual inspection of the chuck back plate indicated that the spindle nose stop face was only making partial contact with the chuck back plate. So my task is to find out what face is out and by how much. My DTI indicated that the nose stop face was 0.03mm out of flat, that's just over a thou. To clean up this face I used a high speed steel cutter with a fine radius on the tip. The RPM was set to the lowest speed I could possibly get on this machine and the feed was set to about one and a half thou. The depth of cut I wanted was just enough to clean off the error and to use a sharp high speed steel tool kept the push off to an absolute minimum. You can see here that the material removal rate was indeed minimal judging by the swarf hanging off this cutter. That's a lot better. I had a few people ask why my chuck has scallops in the chuck face. The answer is I don't know. But what I do know is that this chuck has a very clever trick up its sleeve. That is that the workpiece, as it's nipped up, the workpiece is drawn into the chuck by a very, very small amount. I don't know why, but presumably to prevent the issue that other chucks have when their jaws are tightened. And that is that the workpiece is very, very slightly pushed out. As mentioned earlier, the backplate mating face had more wrinkles than my forehead, causing the mating face to make only a partial contact with the nose face. Using the DTI over the chuck and backplate assembly, I wanted to know how far out the backplate was, and there wasn't much in it. The three pads on the chuck face were showing signs of battle damage, so I had no choice but to strip it down and investigate further. As the back plate came off, rust, swarf and old oil dispatched an odour that would have knocked a dung beetle off its feet. Despite that, the joint faces looked okay, but I wasn't going to take any chances. By using the flattest stones I had, I cleaned off the trace marks that I had made separating the two parts, and some marks that I hadn't expected to see. Here I used three parallel rollers to support the joint face while I compared the opposite face using the DTI. This time the error became much more evident. The wrinkles or dings on this back face produced a three thou variation. I had to clear the vomit inducing crud from its seating before I could find out how far out the chuck face pads really were. As before, I used my best stones to clear the joint face. The bad smell started to dissipate after I used a bit of diesel as a stone lubricant.
Well, it'll probably not surprise you to hear that the pads also varied by two and a half thou. Not surprising considering the scars. Undoing these two screws allowed this chuck to reveal its innermost secrets. Even then it put up a bit of a fight. To stop it getting away from the drift I reach for the wooden restraining block. It soon stops struggling. Having exposed its gizzards, I turned my attention to its teeth, the scroll gear. The scroll plate in most chucks are radially geared on one side and scroll or spirally geared on the other, on a parallel plane to each other. Now, on this chuck, the scroll or spiral gear is cut into an inverted cone and the jaw sliders also follow the same conical track. A little party trick it can do is clamp a workpiece and hold it tight enough that lifting the workpiece up will also lift the jaws and the scroll plate. In theory, this gives the jaws the ability to draw the material towards the chuck as the jaws are tightened. As for reducing the jaw rotation that causes the jaws to gradually bite less nearer the tips over time, well I'm not really convinced that is possible. But just to prove the party trick theory, well that bit of the theory is true, I decided to skim the three pads on the chuck body face just to clean them up. There wasn't anything particularly remarkable about this procedure, except to say that the pads were indeed just a little over two and a half thou out of parallel to the back face. After stoning the back face and grinding the pads, the main chuck body once again owned two parallel faces. Now to sort out the back plate. The spindle nose adapter face has to be parallel to the adapter spigot face. And because I couldn't guarantee to get the spigot face true on a lathe, I chose to grind the nose adapter face. The joint face has a spigot protruding beyond the joint face itself, so I used three parallels to remove that issue but magnetism won't pass through these parallels beyond a slight attraction, so I put two V-blocks at each end to stop it sliding along the magnetic chuck. These two V-blocks allowed me to lightly skim three thou off this top face. They also allowed me to rotate the back plate six times through 60 degrees to do many spark out passes. Despite taking off three thou, a witness mark still remained. I didn't take too much off the overall length for fear of having the spindle nose thread crashing into the back of the chuck before the back plate has properly seated against the spindle nose face that I machined earlier. I compared the parallelism this way up because if there were any issues it would amplify it. I inserted the scroll plate back into the main body after a light spray of lubricant on the scroll face. The radial geared side was treated to more of a squirt than a dollop of lithium based grease. This shim was measured for wear and tear. The shiny and obviously well worn outer edge was two thou thinner than the inner unused section so I cut a two thou shim to fit under the original one because I hadn't got any shim stock to directly replace it.
After refitting the three pinion gears, the back of the chock body was refitted, this time and hopefully without any bruising on the joint faces. Before I mounted the chuck, I lubricated the nose thread with a little bit of light machine oil. The chuck spun on and with a reassuring clunk it met the nose seating face cleanly. To check out how much run out exists now, I used a ground roller long enough to be fully gripped by the jaws while leaving enough sticking out to clock up against. The clock is dancing about while I tap it with my fingers to get it to point on zero. Wow, that's absolutely astonishing. I'd have been happy with up to 2000. It's just got to be a fluke. Nothing could be that good on a machine this old. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.